So far, we've only looked at problems with a single objective, but most problems have competing objectives. So often, more than one objective can be identified for a given problem. We want to maximize return or minimize risk, maximize profit or minimize pollution. These objectives often conflict with each other. Something as simple as choosing what to wear every morning. You want to look professional if you're headed into the office, but you also want to be comfortable. And depending on the day, you might be more motivated to dress up, and, and some other days you may be more motivated to be comfortable. But if you've been called in on a weekend, you might try your luck heading into work in a comfortable pair of jeans, something you might not pull on a Tuesday. This illustrates how these objectives can often conflict. So we're going to explore how to solve for such problems. The first type of problem we'll examine is goal programming. So far, the linear programming problems we looked at have had hard constraints. Constraints that cannot be violated, like having only 1,566 labor hours available, or only $850,000 available for projects. But in some cases, these hard constraints are too restrictive and they don't represent reality. So you might have, when car shopping, a price you want to pay for a vehicle, but you have some flexibility if you get close to that constraint or goal. If you are stuck over $100 or $200 on a $30,000 purchase, you can usually make it work. And this is an example of a soft constraint, and we use these to represent constraints that don't have to be exact. So we use soft constraints to represent these targets. So let's look at an example. Davis McCown wants to expand the convention center at his hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. But note that this could also apply to an expansion to a clinic or a hospital. Well, here we're looking at adding a different variety of conference rooms. We're looking at adding small, medium, and large conference rooms, but you could also be adding treatment rooms, operating rooms, meeting spaces, or even looking at equipment purchases. Davis's constraints are that he wants to add five small, 10 medium, and 15 large conference rooms. He also wants the total expansion to be 25,000 square feet and to cost no more than a million dollars. So let's walk through the process of setting up the problem. It has a few more steps than the linear programming problems we've worked with so far, but I think as you work through the process, it will make sense and help you achieve your desired outcome. So first, let's define our decision variables. In Excel, these are the values we tell Solver to adjust. So X1 is the number of small rooms to add, X2 is the number of medium rooms to add, and X3 is the number of large rooms to add. Next, we define our goals. This step is new to this type of problem, but instrumental to defining the constraints for the model. So our first goal is to have five small conference rooms, 10 medium conference rooms, 15 large conference rooms, and in addition to the number of each size room, we want the expansion to be about 25,000 square feet and that it should cost no more than about a million dollars. So when we're working with goal programming, we have these new coefficients. Mathematically, Excel, Excel Solver will handle the math, but when we include these coefficients of D, which represent the over and under from those goals, they become additional variable cells. So instead of having just three cells for Excel to change, it will actually work with nine because we'll also include the over and actually it's more than nine because the expansion and total cost are also 
uh, have the coefficient for the uh, over under. So you'll see that as we set up the Excel spreadsheet that there are new cells that we add to represent how far we are from the goal and it will indicate whether you are below the goal or over the goal. Because some goals you want to, you can approximate, others you have a hard ceiling. So this is the goal constraints illustrated mathematically. Although there are several feasible objective functions that could be formulated for a goal programming problem. So but they all aim to minimize the sum of the deviations from the objectives. So we want to minimize the deviation from our five small conference rooms or 25,000 square foot expansion size or million dollar budget. This might not seem so complex at the surface, but we uh, Suppose the first goal is underachieved by one small room and the fifth goal is overachieved by $20,000. The ratio of those over-unders are substantially different. Uh, overachieving the fifth goal by $20,000 is a 2% deviation, but underachieving the first goal, the number of small conference rooms, is a 20% deviation. So this implies being $20,000 over budget is just as undesirable as having one too few small rooms. Does that seem right? So instead of just taking the... So to address this problem, we can use weights, where we look at the weighted sum of deviations or the weighted sum of percent deviations. If your goals are expressed in different units, and they are in our example. They are the number of rooms, square feet, and dollars. It is more practical to minimize the weighted sum of the percent deviations. Weights are helpful because they can also allow more or less emphasis to be placed on different goals at the discretion of you, the analyst. So after all of that, let's define our objective function. We have a few additional assumptions which might require us to use weights. We don't want to underachieve any of the first three room goals. We don't want to deviate at all from the 25,000 square foot requirement, and going over budget is a big no-no. To start, we assume all weights will equal one. Goal programming problems with weights are often iterative, meaning we make adjustments to the weights and run the model several times before finding the right balance. And this is where your judgment is at least as important as the software that's chomping away at that objective function you see. This slide illustrates how to set up this problem in Excel, but an example has also been posted to eCampus. So let's take a look at what we've got. We have the variable cells for our conference rooms. So that would be the actual amount of conference rooms. And then based on the number of conference rooms, square feet and the cost will populate. You can see that there's, it uses the sum product of B9 through D9 uh, and B5 through D5. So that is the square footage multiplied by the actual amount. And then these 10 cells here represent the under and over from the goal. So these are also included in Solver for Solver to adjust for us and tell us about the deviations. So they're not pre-populated. Our goal is the sum of C9 plus C10 minus C11. And this illustrates uh, one of our, our constraints. Um, those values for C10, 
C9 is the actual number of rooms, C10 is the, per, is the amount under, and C11 is the amount over. So that's why it's plus C10 minus C11 mathematically. And then our objective function is going to use the percentage deviation and the weights as it's as the objective function. And here in every objective function for a solve our problem must have an equation or a formula in the in the cell. Sometimes it can be hard to think through what that should look like, but it's an absolute requirement. So now let's take a look at how we would go about setting this up in Solver. So you set your objective cell, in this case it's B23, and the variable cells, you have to highlight two areas. So B10, uh, So B10 through F11, so that would be this area. And then um, B9 to D9, these three cells up here. So in Windows, you just put a comma between the, the two sets of cells you want it to change. It may be different on Mac versions of Excel. So just watch out for that, but you, you end up having to highlight two areas of cells to get the variable cells in to the solver model. And then we look at our constraints. So B10 uh, through F11 down here must be greater than or equal to zero. So they can hold a zero value, but they can't be negative. Uh, B12, the goal, through F12 has to equal the uh, uh, target values. So these are our goal. These are the goals. Our target value is to have five small, 10 medium, 15 large conference rooms. And the actual amount has to I ideally equal our target values. The actual number of conference rooms must be integers. We cannot have one and a half small conference rooms. They have, we can have one or two, but we can't have partial conference rooms. And that these values must all take on a value greater than zero. In this example, you also want to make sure you make unconstrained variables non-negative. When you do this, it means that it will automatically assume every value must be above, must be non-negative. But in this case, some of uh, there are values that may take negative forms, so we uh, want to uh, uncheck that box. So now we can solve for the problem. And we find that given our new assumptions where we wanted to be careful about going over and under, we end up with a scenario where our, we end up going 250 square feet over and we come in at just at, at a, we come in at a, almost $100,000 over budget. The square footage here and the cost here are what the result of the model are. These down here are the goals. And Solver tried to optimize as best it could, but we still deviate somewhat from our goals. And we can see here that we're over by 9.73% and over by 1% for our square footage. So these tend to be iterative, and we can think hard about what our objectives are. Um, so budget is really important, and we really want to be right on the money with the square footage, and we're 
more willing to sacrifice a conference room uh, or we don't want to sacrifice like any of the conference rooms um, but uh, it was really important to meet that 25,000 square foot requirement so we can go through and we can make some adjustments iteratively first we're going to add more weight to the cost so now instead of a weight of one it's going to have a weight of ten so think of that ratio the ratio of one to ten one is a single unit and ten is ten units so compared to the weights on the other elements of the model the weight we're applying to keeping to budget is immense so we can go back into solver Everything's already set up from our first attempt. And here we find that we are only 1% over, although we're sacrificing two large conference rooms. And our square foot footage is under uh, 25,000 square feet. So is this exactly what we want? Well, maybe not. Maybe we really, really do want more large conference rooms. So now let's do another iteration. So here, to get the 15 large conference rooms, the number of medium conference rooms was reduced by three. However, we also see that we're under budget by 1750 although we're still 2,000 square feet below that magical 25,000 square feet goal. So in a fourth attempt, I might change the uh, weight on square feet. In fact, why not just do it now? The brilliant thing about these spreadsheets is that they're reusable and we can make modifications and adjustments to our heart's content. Maybe we've decided the square footage requirement is a little too restrictive so we're not going to put a weight on it as heavy as for the large uh, conference rooms and the construction costs so we're going to put a weight of five these weights are defined by you so there's no formula you decide what the weights are so putting that weight of five didn't change anything and that sometimes happens let's try putting a, a, a bigger weight on it and see what happens Every time you make a change like that, you must rerun Solver to get the optimized result. I know sometimes things will change, including the objective itself, but always run it again because I made that change and the objective cell changed to 1.1, but when I rerun Solver, it actually goes down to 1.01. .01. So when you change anything, always rerun Solver. So by increasing the weight on the square footage to a 10, we are now back over budget. We're still under our square footage. We only gained 750 square feet and one medium conference room. So maybe we just have a 23,000 square foot, uh, a 23,000 uh, square foot addition. I know it doesn't have the same ring to it as 25,000, but you know, it just isn't right. It just isn't good for this time. And these percentage deviations are the, or in this case, B10, which is our under, divided by B13. Note that this uses a dollar sign between B and 13. That means it will stay attached to the B column, or it'll stay attached to row 13, but let you move across the row of cells so you can easily copy it and then you can also copy it down to the cells below uh, to capture that percentage deviation which again when you're working with different units is generally a better means of comparison than just looking at the raw units uh, in this case square footage is 1250 and large conference rooms are 15 so looking at that percentage that's that's why that's very helpful there So that's how we set up the problem in Excel. And these are the settings for Solver in case you need to look them up. 
What we learn from goal programming is that it involves making trade-offs among the goals until the most satisfying solution is found. This means it can be a little bit more time consuming than the approaches we've tried so far. Focus on the solutions and compare the values generated on each iteration. But also remember that if you apply a very large weight to a soft constraint, that it will effectively become a hard constraint. Though sometimes in the process of developing a project, new priorities emerge and it's important to apply a very large weight. And when that happens, well, that's just fine. So this is the process or the summary of goal programming. You first want to identify the decision variables in the problem, and that's not new. Then you want to identify and formulate any hard constraints in the problem. Next, you want to state the goals of the problem along with their target values. You want to create constraints using decision variables that would achieve the goals. You want to transform the constraints into goal constraints by including deviational variables. Those are those that D minus and D plus uh, variables that were added to the constraint, uh, the equations for the constraints. You want to determine which deviational variables represent undesirable deviations from the goal. So for example, it was very undesirable to go over budget in our hotel expansion example. We want to formulate an objective that penalizes the undesirable deviations. We then want to identify appropriate weights for the objective, and that can be an iterative process as I demonstrated. Then you're going to solve the problem, and then you're going to analyze the solution. And if the solution is unacceptable, you can go back to step eight and revise the weights as needed. So the process is a little more complex than the five steps for a basic linear programming model, but consider how much more powerful this model is.